Okay, thank you for all those braving the after lunch session. Uh, we have a session with a more biological uh, twist to it. And uh, we'll start with uh, Rafi Kornstein from the Faculty of Medicine, uh, talking today about nanoscale undulations of the cell membrane. Thank you, Iftar. <clears throat> Uh, the presentation today is really going to uh, address both uh, physicists a little bit and uh, biologists as well. It's really, the topic is uh, biophysics. Uh, <clears throat> I will uh, address three main uh, features. One, I will uh, describe a little bit the characteristics of uh, nanoscale uh, cell membrane fluctuation. I will describe how one measures on cells nanoscale events or nanoscale m movements to be more precise. And then I will deal with uh, some possible underlying mechanism responsible for m modulation of this uh, phenomenon. So the question is where, why, and the uh, and how, really. So the background, the cells are really living system, and one uh, characteristic of any living uh, creature is uh, mobility, sometimes also motility. In this case, I will speak about cells that uh, do not move or do not have uh, ability for, of locomotion, and that means to move one from one point to the other, but I will speak about cells that are driven by a fluid flow like red blood cells. But generally, the, the cell membrane is the interface between the cells and the environment. And one of the ways of the cell to sense the environment is to move the membrane a different direction and feel gradients and other effectors in the vicinity. And what uh, we know uh, on the movement are some con conventional type of deformation, like what we call philopodia. And philopodia is a movement of a cell, conventional one and known one, where it uh, uh, spreads some fingers or finger-like structure from the cell surface driven by uh, actin or polymer type of fibrils inside cells that uh, polymerizes and depolymerizes, so it's very active and is very plastic, and it really drives the extension of this finger to the surrounding. It may be part of, a, of the locomotion of a whole cell from this place to this one. So we see sending, you know, the finger attachment and then movement and then uh, uh, really uh, breaking out of bonds between the substrate on this side and forming new ones on this side. But the phenomena that I am going to describe is different from this one, which is rather slow. The time scale here is between uh, uh, 10 seconds and several minutes, and the length dimension, the scaling for the physicist, is uh, between 200 uh, nanometer and several microns. The phenomena that I am going to describe today is uh, different one, and. Uh, and that's, uh, and it deals really with uh, rapid membrane uh, fluctuations. That means that the time scale is one second or less, and the uh, scale length dimension is between 10 and uh, 100 uh, nanometers. Now, the 10 is really a limit of our possibility to uh, detect it using uh, regular or co conventional or non-conventional even uh, methods of measurements on living cells. Please pay attention to that we don't 
measure here movements of uh, you know solids. So it's not like we uh, measure a, a displacement by some piezoelectric element, but we measure on very elastic and very sticky uh, structure, and it's uh, rather hard to use, for example, atomic force uh, microscopy to scan or probe locally even the uh, movement of a living uh, cell. So we, so we have to do it otherwise, and how we do it, uh, we, we do it uh, optically in a non-invasive way, and I will go into it. Now, we can take, now these uh, cell membrane uh, fluctuations are really characteristic of many different cells, but they are best characterized in erythrocytes, and erythrocytes from many different points of view really serve as the simplest cellular model, which is comprised of a membrane, a very simple skeleton, and they are devoid of the complicated organelles of a usual cell. That means they don't possess a nucleus, they don't possess internal membrane organelles like mitochondria and others. So it's from the it's, it's really ideal biophysical living cell. Now, uh, <clears throat> in order to show you really what I am uh, talking about, I will uh, try and uh, show you uh, a video clip showing really, so it's a, a video clip taken at a rate of around uh, um, 10 images per second. And it really uh, shows you the whole uh, movement of the whole cell. So at least you know that the type of movement is out of plane movement of the membrane. So it's not a lateral movement, but it's out of plane movement. And the question is, OK, uh, is it important? If it is, uh, how do we? Can we modulate it, and what is the underlying mechanism? Is this image from the outside of the cell? Sorry? Is this image from the outside? From the outside of the what cell. What is this depression in the middle? Well, this is uh, the classical shape of erythrocyte, which is a big concave one. So what we so we see, it's like a bagel. So we see, so this is the the bagel hole, if you want. But it's not a hole; it's uh, just very thin. Okay. So some uh, significance to, to these uh, fluctuations. Since this is a movement, it does reflect the mechanical characteristic of uh, the, the membrane skeletal complex, and I will go to the details on, on, on the skeletal in one in one minute, but we can calculate mechanical properties of the cell membrane, meaning uh, bending and shearing modulus of the cell uh, membrane. Now, this uh, reflects mechanical fluctuations, but it also uh, affects uh, fundamental processes like cell substrate or cell cell adhesion kinetics and passage of circulating uh, cells through very narrow blood uh, vessels, and there the driving force is uh, very low. And the, the reason why they do affect uh, this uh, uh, cell substrate or cell cell adhesion is due to repulsive forces between the cell and the substrate due to the, to the movement. It's really an entropically driven uh, process. I mean, uh, in repulsion, it's also called Helfrich forces. Helfrich was uh, the, uh, the one who really co contributed a lot to the understanding the um, mechanics of membranes, with the spontaneous curvature of membranes and other notion that he had introduced into the literature. Now, these uh, fluctuations can be uh, 
modulated by physiological effectors like hormones, but the underlying physiological mechanism is yet uh, unknown. And here I uh, brought some examples. So in this example, we look on the amplitude of the fluctuation as a function of a hormone, adrenaline, that we, are, that we all, all know. So it's a kind in pharmacology of a dose response curve. And we see that uh, rather low physiological levels of hormones are uh, enough really to uh, stimulate uh, or enhance the level of fluctuation. Now this really leads to increase in the filtrability. In this uh, figure, we see the filtrability of red blood cells through very narrow pores, pores that are smaller than the dimension of the cell. So in order for the cell to undergo through such a pore, it has to undergo a... <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> it has to undergo the formation. I will shut it down. And uh, we see here a linear correlation even between the level of amplitude of fluctuation and the level of the filtrability of cells through such pores. So this really m may lead to change in, uh, if you want, blood flow to the very narrow uh, blood uh, uh, vessels in our body. Now, this is another dimension where the, the level of CMF may be also associated with pathology. In this case, we have taken lymphocytes, so it shows that fluctuation is also possessed by other cells, but uh, two lines. So we have taken a line and what we call in biology a subline. So these are two cells originating from the same source, but one under, underwent some additional genetic modification relative to the other one. So this line that possesses higher amplitude is metastatic one, and this one is a non-metastatic one. So we see here a correlation between the phenotype or the, whether a cell is metastatic or not and the level of fluctuation. So it shows of some possible uses even in the diagnosis. Now, what I am going to show you is to uh, demonstrate uh, uh, experimental proof for uh, this hypothesis. Our working hypothesis is that modulation of membrane skeleton interaction really modulates uh, cell membrane fluctuation with that influence uh, the physiology of them. And this is really to, uh, uh, to show you the structure of the membrane. So the cell, the red blood cell membrane is composed of a bilayer. In the bilayer, we find some proteins that form anchors to the underlying polymer that is the skeleton of the erythrocyte, which is called spectrin. So these two hooks connect the spectrin mesh to the membrane. We see this very clearly here. This is the inner side of the erythrocyte. And we see here a very ordered mesh of a polymer connected to the membrane through two types of uh, junction. One is the uh, uh, blue one which is associated with a protein called glycophorin C. We'll see it later. And the other one are the yellow ones here that are uh, made of what we call bent 3. This is really an ion exchanger that is a transporter of ions. But here it serves also, it has a mechanical function. Okay, in order to uh, prove our uh, hypothesis, we need first to be able to measure 
cell membrane fluctuation, we have to be able to modulate the membrane skeleton interaction, and uh, we have also to be able to uh, measure it. We choose to modulate it by a simple chemical treatment, like changing the external pH, both up and down. And the type of measurement that we did, we used two methodologies, one that we previously developed and a newer one that was uh, developed by others and has been introduced into the literature about five or, or six years ago. So the first method that we call point dark field microscopy is a microscopy that is based uh, on scattering of light from the cell edge. So what we, we see here is a source of light passing through an objective where there is a block of, for the direct light. Only uh, light, the only light that, can, that comes out is a light that forms a certain annulus. So it forms an annulus here. It's being collected, it passes through a pin, additional pin, and a, a PMT, or photo detector. And, and then we can measure uh, the change in light scattering. The sample sits here, and this is a magnification of it. The cell is attached to a cover slip, and we focus here, so when the cell is out of focus, there is no scattering of light, and we see a dark field. But when the cell edge comes into the focus, it uh, scatters light into the direction of the micro objective, which is being collected here and goes here. So, in fact, we do measure time-dependent changes in light scattering, and these are really uh, proportional to the movement of the, the cell edge. There are some advantage in this, uh, uh, advantages of this uh, methodology. The biggest advantage is that it's very sensitive one, even more than the, the, the more modern ones. However, it's being restricted that at every measurement we can measure on, from a single point here. This is a pinhole, or a pinhole that is, uh, let's say, uh, 50 microns by 50 uh, microns, and it's being uh, transmitted here to 100x objective. So the light of illumination here is around 0.5 micron by 0.5 micron. So it's a very small area from which we measure light scattering. The other method is uh, what is called the uh, digital holographic microscopy. It's basically interferometry, very uh, classical one, but uh, converted into a microscopic uh, setup. The principle, I think, we uh, already covered to the, to the morning, but in principle, we have here two beams. This is a reference beam, and that's a beam passing through the specimen. They intermingle here or interfere here, and we, we do get the interference hologram uh, on a camera. What we see here is the following. The raw data, this is the hologram, and the hologram has both phase and intensity information. When we uh, reconstruct by software the hologram into a phase image, so this is a phase image, this is the, the level of the gray scale is given in radians. Uh, this is really what we, uh, what we get. A 3D reconstruction of the phase gives us this typical shape of the erythrocyte. And this shape and its detail are really comparable with an AFM uh, measurement on uh, the whole cell. The resolution at the, at the Z direction of the interferometer is around, I would say, practically uh, 5 or 10 nanometers. 
And, but the resolution at the XY dimension, that means this and this, not the high, is the classical uh, diffraction limited uh, resolution of uh, a microscope. So it's a combination of both nanoscale and uh, sub microscale uh, resolution depending on what we measure and where we measure. If we take a single point on this uh, phase and we record it as a function of time, so this is the, a time series, and the blue is, is really the, a time series of the noise outside, we can isolate the uh, fluctuation here or the signal from the noise and the signal is, uh, or the signal in absolute length, in nanometers, is really a function of uh, both the refractive index of the cell, that of the medium, and the wavelength that we use for uh, detection. If we take now uh, the standard deviation, and that means the fluctuation over the whole cell, we see that the normal uh, untreated red uh, blood cells ha have radial dependence of fluctuation in this range, so in the range of, let's say, up to 100 or 120 uh, nanometer, the highest one. Uh, but when we treat it chemically, it's even increases, uh, please, please pay attention that the scale here is different than the scale here. But when we cross-link by gluter aldehyde, so it's chemical cross-linking of the whole cell, we do have attenuation of fluctuations. Yes, please. Okay, okay. Uh, I can go back, no, that's back. Okay, this is the, so there is a direct relationship between the height, the thickness, okay? This is uh, actually the formula, okay? So this is the height or the, a displacement in nanometer. This is the standard deviation in radians. This is the wavelength. And this is the refractive index of the cell and that's of, of the medium. Now, in order to be able to uh, resolve it, you have to know the refractive index of the medium and that of the cell. Okay, the wavelength, you know that's uh, the wavelength that, that you are working with. In order to uh, determine exactly the refractive index of the cell, what you do, you do measure it in two different media with two uh, different refractive indices and by having then uh, two equation with two unknown, you can solve it. Okay, it depends on the refractive index, on the local re re refractive in index, sure. But the, um, in the erythrocytes, unlike eukaryotic, more complicated cells, you assume that the refractive index is really determined by the protein or by the hemoglobin in the cell. And that's the main thing. And that's uh, homogeneously uh, distributed in the, in the cytosol. So the refractive index in the cell is uniform in a way. Okay? The thickness is not, but the, the, the material uh, optical properties are. This is an assumption, naturally. Otherwise, you have to, to do the same measurement, you know, but determine the length locally. So you can do it. I mean, if the cell is completely under steady state condition and doesn't change, even a eukaryotic one, you can determine the local refractive index at each pixel, and from there you can calculate the, the height at each phase pixel. So, 
Sorry? Uh, they have to be attached to the surface, immobilized. Not fixed, because fixing is <laughs> chemical. I use chemical fixing here as, as well. OK. Um, uh, this is just to show you that the, this is the blue curve is just a cross section of the morphology of the cell. And the dimension here is around the 2,000 uh, nanometer. Now, the green line shows the fluctuation of the standard deviation of fluctuation across, and it really shows that in the middle, in the non-strained area, we have the lowest uh, level of fluctuations, while when we, in this region, which are not even at the peak, we do have the highest one. So we, we do have here some type of uh, radial dependence of uh, fluctuation in the cell. OK, so I said that I will uh, try and uh, demonstrate how we uh, modulate uh, cell or membrane skeletal interaction by pH change. So what we did, we measured by point dark field microscopy the amplitude or the bandwidth of the uh, amplitude the distribution of fluctuation as a function of the pH. And uh, uh, we have chosen then to, use, to, to measure at uh, 8.6 and at uh, 5.6. So we see here increase in fluctuation when the pH rises up, and we see here decrease of uh, fluctuation when the pH goes down. Now, a determination of the effect of the membrane skeleton interaction we uh, analyze by biochemical method. Biochemically, what we do, we take detergent, we extract those membrane proteins that are not attached to the skeleton. Then we spin down the skeleton, dissolve it, and run analysis of the type of proteins associated with the skeleton over the spectrum, which is in biological terms called a Western type of uh, analysis. And what we have analyzed was the, the level of Ben3 and the level of glycophorin C. These are serve just as a normalization uh, proteins, both spectrin and actin. And we do see that uh, the level of uh, Ben3 changes when we uh, uh, lower the pH and, and changes a little bit also when, we, when the pH is higher. And the same is true here. Here, we don't see any association of glycophorin C or very low amount with the skeleton at low pH, while at high pH, uh, we see uh, increased association. So these are the levels of the association of the protein as a function of the pH. Ben3, this is the yellow protein on the cartoon that I've shown you, uh, is increase its association with the uh, skeleton, while uh, glycophorin C diminishes it and vice versa here. When we... Uh, Analyze it in terms of the copies, okay? These are the number of copies of Ben3 that are associated per cell to the cytoskeleton. And the same is true for glycophorin C. And this is serves as a 100%, I mean, in, in our experiments. When we change the uh, pH, we see here reduction to 45%, and here, Increase. So here we see the total number of linkages, really, in a single cell between the membrane and the skeleton. So overall, we see that the, the linkage between the membrane and the uh, skeleton increased here, which led to a decrease in fluctuations. Here, it decreased because we take this one with this one, it's still lower than 
250,000 plus 45,000. And uh, so this leads to up regulation of uh, CMF. Conclusions. Increased or decreased uh, attachment of the uh, membrane with the cytoskeletal is associated with decrease or increased amplitude of cell membrane uh, fluctuations. It is yet to be determined. This is not uh, a simple mechanical uh, model. Uh, we do have indication that the two uh, junctions contribute in opposite way to the uh, fluctuation, but the role has yet to be uh, determined. Before finishing, I would like to thank my collaborators in the groups, Alexander Babul, Hadash Shemesh, who did the point out field my uh, microscopy, Lila Beno, Itzhak Ronen, Shlomo Levin, who worked with me for many years on this, and ex-PhD student uh, Shmuel Tuvia. On the digital holographic microscopy, we collaborated with uh, a group in, uh, in uh, uh, optics from the EPFL, and these are our collaborators there. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Um, what happens if you look at the epithelial cells yes. that are attached to each other? Do you have, do you have a suppression of these modulations? Well, I don't know. I would uh, assume that we do have uh, a suppression because uh, still it depends. I mean, it depends where, where you measure. Epithelial cells are really very highly invaginated. So I don't think that the tight junctions are really the determining uh, factor, but rather the association of the cortical skeleton with the membrane. And this is going to be the decisive factor determining the fluctuation level.